everyone. We begin our event by acknowledging that today we each gather from various places across these beautiful lands of Turtle Island. We acknowledge the First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples who call this place home. We recognize all First Peoples who were here before us, those who live here now, and the seven generations to come. We acknowledge the various treaties of these lands and the unceded territories. These treaties represented the coming together of nations in friendship and peace. We grieve the broken promises. May we respect and consult the Indigenous peoples who stand to protect and recover the sacred lands. Our gratitude extends across Turtle Island. From the mighty rivers, we receive our electricity, and from the fertile soils, we receive our food. The waters gift us life, and the trees gift us breath. From the highest mountains to the outstretched prairies, from the rocky tundra terrain to the ocean shores, the land carries life, hope, and sacred stories of Creator. We strive to be responsible stewards of the land and respect the cultures, ceremonies, and traditions of all who call it home. We work, play, and live as guests on this land now known as Canada and Bermuda. We invite you from wherever you are joining to visit www.native-land.ca to learn about the traditional lands on which you live. I am so excited to have you joining us for our Territorial Women's Event, The Well. We come to you today from across our beautiful territory, from the rugged coastline of Newfoundland and Labrador, to the beautiful Rocky Mountains in the West, to the beautiful beaches of Bermuda. I greet you from my home in St. John's, Newfoundland. Some of you may be wondering the inspiration behind the name The Well. As we imagine the beautiful scene at the well where Jesus had an intriguing conversation with the Samaritan woman, we have invited women to the well in a cafe style setting with a contemporary backdrop, sharing in conversation over coffee. We invite you to listen to rich and encouraging conversations about how with Jesus' power and strength, we can be resilient and to listen to the word and join us in beautiful worship. Now. I invite you to go grab a coffee if you haven't already, or Mikey's tea, as you get ready to pause at the well. I'm also excited to introduce our two co-hosts for the well, Jenna Reed and Christina Loris. Jenna is a second year communication student at Memorial University of Newfoundland and Labrador. She is an aspiring journalist and was the summer cruiser host for a local Newfoundland radio station during summer 2021. She is also an aspiring Christian writer and speaker, and she is passionate about growing her faith. This is evident through her blog and website, Wholehearted Pursuit, which represents her desire to be in an authentic relationship with God as a university student navigating young adulthood. Jenna is also my daughter, and it's so fun to have her sharing in ministry today with me in this way. Christina is a TV show host on Yes TV for the show Living Local Canada and has made several hosting appearances on the longest running Canadian TV show, 100 Huntley Street. Over the last few years in her career, Christina has traveled around all of Southern Ontario, meeting people from far and wide to hear their stories and share some of the most exciting activities for audiences to do. Alongside her career, she is a longtime Jesus follower and has been passionate about sharing the gospel everywhere she goes since her early days in university. With a focus on career and the church, her mission is to make people feel heard and share the good news of Jesus. As we prepare to worship, please join me in prayer. Dear God, we come into your presence from across this territory and beyond. As we join in worship and listen to rich conversation, I pray that you will open the hearts of every woman listening to hear from you, to enter into conversation with you. I pray in these moments, as we pause in the midst of our day, our routines, that you will pour your Holy Spirit down upon us in all your power and glory. 
I pray that we would be encouraged and strengthened in our personal faith journey. We thank you for your love and loving us so much that you gave us your son to be our savior. And because of your gift, we can experience your grace. And we thank you that in your power and strength, we can be resilient. Renew our hearts today as we unite with women across the Canada and Bermuda Territory. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for the warm introduction, Major Jennifer. That was awesome. And I do have my coffee here, so I'm very excited to be drinking that through this whole thing. I love coffee. <laughs> Today, we are gathered together virtually to engage in this wonderful women's ministry event, The Well. My name is Christina, as mentioned previously, and I'm just thankful to be here with you today. We've got some amazing things in store. Definitely. Um, I'm Jenna Reed, and I am also very, very excited for today. The Well, as Major Jennifer mentioned, is a virtual territorial women's event that will unite women together in worship across the territory and to hear inspiring women share personal stories of triumph and resilience. We have invited women to share in conversation with us with a modern take on this biblical scene, similar to us sharing in conversations with a friend over coffee at the local cafe. We are also gathering coast to coast today, which I think is super exciting because we have women participating from all across the Canada and Bermuda territory. So you might see some familiar faces which is amazing. <laughs> Today we can expect a day full of Jesus. Stories involving resilience and faith, healthy living and worship that we can engage in. Today we'll be filled with words of wisdom and truth. So wherever you are today, grab a notebook and a pen and stay present to hear what the Lord has to say through these powerful women of faith. So first, I'm going to introduce our worship guest. This is Laura Hastings. She is a Vancouver-based worship leader, music educator, and certified music therapist, songwriter, and entertainer. Her passion for music has led her to pursue many areas of musical expression and instruction. This includes a voiceover work for Hasbro's My Little Pony and the release of a solo album in 2010. She is currently serving at the Way Church, located in Vancouver, BC, and is thrilled to be included in this year's conference. Um, having served at the Willows in Langley and Camp Sunrise for many years prior to moving to Montreal in 2017 to complete a master's in music therapy from Concordia University. Her vocational interest in medical music therapy has her working at the NICU at Surrey Memorial Hospital with families and premature infants. It's so beautiful bringing the power of music to help promote attachment and bonding, neurological development and resiliency. We love that word here. <laughs> Worship as at the center of Laura's personal relationship with Christ. She has seen and experienced miracles and breakthroughs while worshiping Jesus, and she feels deeply honored to be participating and gathering in this way. Laura will be leading us through worship with an intimate experience with her and her guitar. I encourage you to sing along, lift your hands and praise the Lord, and sing words of truth and life over yourself and everybody around you today.
you are right now, whatever setting you're in, that we would fill these atmospheres with praise, that we would join together and sing to a God that is so worthy of our worship and so worthy of all the glory. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah Hallelujah, my weapon is a melody, I raise a hallelujah, I will watch the darkness flee, oh I'm gonna sing in the middle of a storm, louder and louder, you're gonna hear
lift our voices. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder.
Welcome back, everyone. Wow, that was such a wonderful way to start us off today. Worship is one of my favorite things because when I don't have the words to speak or when I feel like I'm full of joy, singing and listening to worship lifts my spirits and allows me to praise Jesus in a new way every single time. Yeah, I personally love the song, Raise the Hallelujah. The chorus has always been one of my favorites because it says, I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're going to hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated. The king is alive. I believe these lyrics are truly fitting, especially as we highlight some wonderful stories of resilience today. I pray hope will arise. Now that we've prepared our hearts with worship, we have two phenomenal guests that will be sharing their stories in an intimate discussion with us today. We will be speaking with Sarah Fusile, who has a story of joy amidst suffering, and will share with us how her faith grew stronger amidst some of the hardest times that she faced. But our first guest today is Major Shannon Howard. Shannon was born and raised in Trillingate, Newfoundland, until she moved away to Winnipeg, Manitoba, to attend William and Catherine Booth College, where she received her bachelor's degree in Biblical and Theological Studies. She met her husband, Jeff, there, and they married in 2002. Just a few months later, they entered the Salvation Army at College for officer training in Toronto, Ontario. Commissioned in 2004, Shannon and her husband have served as Corps officers in High River, Alberta, Whitehorse, Yukon, and Toronto, Ontario. They became the Corps officers of Deer Lake Citadel in 2019 and have fallen in love, love with the people, people community, community, and culture. Shannon is especially thrilled to be finally back on the rock. They have two young kids as well, Grayson and Marilyn, who keep them busy and on their toes. Shannon, we are super excited to have you here today and hear your story of resilience as it centers around your journey towards achieving a healthier lifestyle. Um, to start, let's give some background, and then I'm going to ask you a few questions. So how would you say your journey towards healthy living started? Um, I decided that I could no longer live the way I was living. Um, that I needed to make some changes. And so almost two years ago, I started down that path of not just fixing what I was eating, but also all the other things that kind of get in the way of healthy living, making sure that I was exercising, uh, digging into the word a little more, and just deciding that I had had enough of being uh, the way that I was. All right. And so when you put, um, when you're putting faith into healthy living, because I know you, I know you brought that up. Um, would you say there was any Bible verses or anything that helped guide you and motivate you through this process? My life verse, anybody who knows me knows that my absolute favorite verse and has been ever since I was a teenager, um, is Proverbs three, five to six. And I quote it all the time in almost every life situation that I've been in. Um, And it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. And that's been um, a verse that's gotten me through so many ups and downs in my life, because in the end, I think we have to trust Jesus. We have to give him our heart and to understand that, Um, We don't know everything. We don't know why we struggle with certain things. We don't know why um, certain things are harder for other people. But in the end, we know that if we've got God, then we're going to be okay. And he's going to direct our path. So that's been probably the biggest uh, help for me in a scripture verse. I love that because it is so relevant. And I think a lot of women here listening can hopefully take that and keep it in their hearts and rely on that when they are going through their own experiences, because, Mm -hmm. you know, God knows the last two years have been absolutely crazy. Um, In our conversation previous to this conference, you emphasized um, how you went through an experience that kind of made the journey towards healthy living a little bit more difficult than you originally anticipated. Um, Do you want to describe some of that? 
Yeah, so um, I have started in April, uh, you know, kind of figuring out uh, the boundaries that I needed with um, around food. I am a self-proclaimed uh, food addict. And so, you know, I decided that I needed some boundaries around things and I was figuring that all out. I had started running which I loved. Um, I love my treadmill. And so I was starting with all of that. And, um, and just, yeah, really getting into things. I was down about 30 pounds, and I was feeling really great. And then my whole world crashed in. Um, I made a literal misstep uh, on a bottom step, and I ended up falling and breaking my ankle. And so that uh, break ended up changing everything uh, for me and making things a lot more difficult um, on this journey of healthy living. And that was actually one of the first things I thought was, but I just started running <laughs> and now I can't run anymore. And I was so heartbroken and, uh, and just didn't want to kind of fall back. Um, as we all know, I'm sure that um, when hard times come, sometimes we like to fall back into old patterns and into old ways. And I really didn't want to do that. I didn't want to give in to that. I wanted to stick with those healthy boundaries that I had made. And so um, it was difficult. It was hard. I can imagine. So first, I'm going to touch on the boundaries piece. Uh -huh. Um what helps you develop boundaries and stick to them? I feel like people find it hard, like boundaries are biblical. And I think that is really, really important to emphasize. However, would you ever say it was uncomfortable to lay out such boundaries, whether it was with people within your spiritual life, like physical health? What was it ever uncomfortable in developing those like circumstances and boundaries you really need to stick through? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I boundaries are biblical. We are given boundaries and we um you know we need boundaries in our life. Um I don't like them. I don't know about anybody else, but uh oftentimes we don't like boundaries. We want to kind of have the freedom to do all these things that we want to do. And so what I found for me um is that I had this mindset that I want to eat what I want when I want. And that was, and to me, I felt like um, all these normal people in the world uh, that didn't struggle with health, that that's what they did, that they could just eat what they want when they wanted. Um, and it was coming to that realization that that's not true. That's not a, a thing um, that we all have boundaries around things or otherwise we would be all going around and uh, being very unhealthy. And so um, coming to kind of realize that I needed to put those boundaries around um, and just seeing in scripture that, you know, God does give us boundaries. We have boundaries in our life that we need to follow and they're there for our safety. They're there to protect us, to guide us. And so it was the same thing with the boundaries for me around food, um, around exercise, all of that, um, that I knew that with God's help that I needed to create those boundaries uh, to keep me safe and to um, keep me healthy. So so boundaries fueled discipline in some ways, <laughs> that self-discipline that I believe is one of the fruits of the spirit as well, self-control. Yeah. Um, in our conversation, again, previous to the conference, you emphasized how your broken ankle was the biggest thing for resilience specifically regarding your spiritual, mental, and physical health. I can only imagine how challenging it must have been, especially as you were just starting, you know, just getting into running. Um, would you say you had any God moments during the broken ankle journey? I had a really big God moment, and um, it was just really amazing. And I love how God works. So um, you would think that with a broken ankle, it would be go to the hospital, get a cast, Six weeks later, you're out of the cast and everything's all fine. Unfortunately, mine didn't go quite that way. I ended up needing to be in hospital for two weeks and uh, needed to have two surgeries. At that time, I've had another one since. Um, so it was a pretty severe um, ankle break. And, um, and it was one that will change my life 
forever. It's uh, something that is going to cause chronic pain and uh, limit my mobility. And so all of those feelings while I was in hospital, but a week into that, in a lot of pain, um, tired, not being able to sleep. We were in the midst of COVID, so nobody was allowed to really come in to visit. And um, it was just a really lonely and dark time. And I was thinking about the future and what that would hold. And so I was getting uh, depressed and um, it was it was hard. The nights especially were really hard. And I remember at one point I knew that I couldn't face another night um, the way they had been. And so I actually reached out on Facebook and I asked all of my friends, um, you know, I'm struggling. Could you just send me a scripture verse, write out a scripture verse in the comments. Could you send me um, a song that you think I would uh, be able to listen to and to help? And I probably had almost 100 comments and uh, and it was just amazing. And everybody just left those scripture verses and those songs. And I meditated on that through the entire night. Um, as the tears came, the pain was there. It was still a hard, a really difficult night. But it changed because all of a sudden I knew not only did I have the prayers of all these people behind me, but God met me in that room in the midst of all of that pain. And I was able to worship through the tears, through the pain, and just to have his help and his strength through those moments, it, it was a turning point. And uh, it really helped. Did I have difficult days after that? Absolutely. Um but it just changed how I, I, my attitude around it, that I knew that God was with me and I was going to be okay. It was going to be okay. That is so lovely. I think faith can really, really help fuel resilience in that regard. Um, one thing to kind of wrap it up in a little, like, a little bit, um, clearly community has been vital in recovering and facing those lonely and hard nights, especially in the hospital, but even through the recovery process. Mm -hmm. So first, I want to ask, how has community fueled re your resilience? And what advice would you give someone struggling who may be looking for a community? So community is so important. And we are in the midst of, you know, COVID during, <clears throat> excuse me, a pandemic where community has changed a lot. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of things now are online mm -hmm. and um, that just changes how you connect with people and that can be very difficult. However, uh, my story and I'm sure lots of others show that when we do reach out, um, you know, whether that is on Facebook or with a phone call, that people are still willing to come around and to help and to support each other. And that's really important. So I would encourage people not only um, to be willing to reach out and say, hey, I need some help. I really need somebody to come around me and to lift me up. But then if you're on the other side of it, if you're doing okay, you know, to be that person that is, you know, watching to see, does somebody need a little encouragement today? Has God put somebody on my mind? to help today. And I think that's really important is to just follow God's leading in that, to ask him to help and to um, just, yeah, to, to be able to follow the Holy Spirit's leading. And so that was uh, really important for me and I'm sure it would be for a lot of people um, for community. And I would encourage people to reach out in that way. I have been so encouraged by your story, Shannon. I think community is so important. We're meant to be in community with one another. And even though COVID may change that in a lot of aspects, I think it is so important to try and find different outlets to engage with others and also reach out and see how you can help individually or give specific things people can help you with in your times of need. So thank you so much, Major Shannon. Your story is truly inspiring and your faith-fueled resilience is incredibly admirable. Next up, we have Laura Hastings and she's going to lead us in some more worship. You are here 
You're moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. Oh my God, that is who you are. You are. Welcome back everyone from that worship. Once again, amazing. I love worship. If you are still here, make sure to stay engaged. There's a lot more the Lord has in store for you. Sarah, we're so glad to have you here to share your story. So let's start with a little bit of background. Where did you grow up and how did you get to where you are today? Sure. I uh, was born in Newfoundland actually, and uh, my parents are Salvation Army officers so uh, that's the life that I had. We uh, lived in northern Manitoba for five years when I was a kid. And then uh, by the time I was 11, we moved to southern Ontario. I've been here ever since. I live in Hamilton now and I'm married. I have two beautiful little girls and I uh, work at McMaster Divinity College as a director of admissions. Awesome. What a, what a beautiful transition to Southern Ontario. I'm a big fan. I live here. So, <laughs> so Sarah, the year 2020 rolls around and a so-called two week lockdown for a worldwide pandemic is being talked about. And you're now at home with two children and your husband. What was that like for you? 
You know, when I look back, I think at first it felt almost a little bit exciting. You know, it was a short term thing and we were going to power through and there was a sort of adrenaline that came with it, um, knowing that it would be hard, but short, you know, you could get through anything uh, that's brief. Uh, And then it just went on and on. And uh, that's when things started to get really difficult for me. Mm -hmm. A lot of us were excited at the beginning of the lockdown thinking, hey, two weeks off work, no big deal. I get to be home with my family. Um, You were diagnosed with anxiety later that year as the pandemic rolled around, as the lockdown kind of stayed as we were at home. How were you able to cope months or weeks before that diagnosis? How did you lean on your family and God during this time? Yeah, um, I didn't cope well. That's that's the truth of it. I know I'm not alone in this. I'm sure a lot of the ladies out here listening struggle with all kinds of mental health issues. And for me, anxiety was just taking over my life. I was um, I would have severe panic attacks, and um, sometimes my husband would just have to just hold me, and I would just sob, and um, he'd pray for me, and you know, we'd take some deep breaths and try to move on with life, but eventually it it just got to be too much. And um, so I finally reached out to my doctor for help. And I'm I'm so glad that I did that. Mm. Yeah. Sometimes it just takes stepping out and realizing I can't do this on my own. I need some help. And COVID being such a big part of that, we are at home alone with our thoughts and so many things that we didn't get to reflect on in the years previous started boiling up with a lot of people. And for you, that that seems to happen. I'm sure also that uh, other, other mothers who are at home, especially uh, working moms, there's this kind of guilt that came with COVID because I was being paid to do my job, but my kids were at home and they needed me. And so I felt like I wasn't doing my job well enough and I wasn't being a mom well enough and I just couldn't do anything right. So there was this constant sort of overwhelming feel of of guilt around all of that, which really made things worse. Guilt, anxiety. And finally, in that same year, you got some really scary news. Tell us about what happened. Yeah, so actually in early December, I, uh, I was sitting wrapping Christmas presents for my kids And um, I had reached out to my doctor previously and I had gone for some blood work that day and I got a call like at nine o'clock that night, which is never good, right? And um, telling me I needed to go to the hospital. Um, So what happened is I had a a uterine fibroid. So this is like a pretty common thing. Lots of women have these, they don't even know they have them and it doesn't affect their lives. But um, mine was just making me uh, lose too much blood every month. And so... My my hemoglobin was at, down at 45, which for people who don't know, low normal is 120. So my doctor said, I don't know how you're still standing. Um, this you're you're not okay. And so I went to the hospital that night and I um had a blood transfusion immediately. And um, you know, we started making preparations for me to have a hysterectomy but I needed to recover. I wasn't well enough to have surgery because my hemoglobin was too low. So it wasn't safe. Um, The couple of months after that, uh, I had many trips to the emergency room once by ambulance. It was all very dramatic and scary. And um, finally I ended up in the hospital actually with an infection from, from one of the procedures that was meant to help. And um, I had to have the surgery, but I still hadn't really recovered enough. Um, Over the span of a few days, they gave me four more units of blood and um, to make me strong enough for the surgery. And so you can imagine, it's just very scary. I have two little kids at home and um, now in the hospital and it's during COVID and uh, it, it was all a lot, but I had the most excellent health care. And I really, I really felt cared for and um, God was with me. And I, uh, thankfully the surgery went well and um, we're almost a year later now and I'm, I'm doing really well. 
Yeah. You can still see though, how, as you retell the story, it's, it's still impactful. You, you feel the weight of it. And I can see that through the way that you're describing those moments. You mentioned several times in your story that God kept you. Can you describe what being kept means to those watching? Sure. I think a lot of times as Christians and maybe especially people who grew up in the church, there's always this sort of feeling, even though we know that, you know, it's it's God's grace, um, we always feel like there are all these things that we need to do, right, to, to keep up and to be a good enough Christian and to, um, yeah, there's a lot of the doing that we feel responsible for. And um, I just reached a point in my life last year where I couldn't, I had nothing to give, literally, um, physically, emotionally, spiritually, I had nothing to give. And um, there was very little I could do. And uh, uh, in, it's in those moments when you realize, you know, God's got me and I'm okay because he's, he's holding on to me. And so I think um, my faith, um, I, my faith wasn't um, struggling. I knew God was taking care of me. And, and I know that God, he's so real in my life. And I, so that wasn't really a struggle. Um, that part was a reminder that, you know, God is holding on to me and he, he kept sending uh, unbelievable message of uh, messages of ways he was taking care of me. And so even down to, um, my OBGYN actually was a wonderful Christian lady from my church. And um, she held my hand while I was um, what, just before surgery until I fell asleep. And I knew she was praying for me. And, you know, he sent my church family around. I don't think we cooked meals in my home for like more than a month because people kept just showing up. And, um, just every, every little piece of life, you know, like I would be struggling and one of my kids would come over and just sit and curl up with me and, mm -hmm. and hold me. And, um, and I think that God shows us, he loves us in all of those ways. Wow. That is so beautiful. It kind of reminds me of the verse that your weakness and your weakness, God is strong. And that's where, that's where we're really able to see him work. We're able to see him work when we have nothing to give and he just comes in to the rescue. Not that he wasn't there before, but that he's a God that goes before us and knows exactly who we are and knows exactly what you are going through. What a wonderful story. Thank you for sharing that with us and really showing us your vulnerabilities. That's really hard to do. But a year later, we're so thankful you're here to really tell your testimony of how God has been there for you. And I'm sure so many women watching today will relate to you in some way, in some capacity. What is one sentence you can share with those watching that, you know, they can watch and take that with them and go forward? Yeah. Uh, I was thinking actually about the woman at the well, and um, this is this is what we all have in common with her. Um, God knows us. God knows me. God knows all of you, and He knows what you need, and He will meet you where you are. And that's what He did for me this past couple of years, and really in my whole life. But it's highlighted in these last couple of years. He completely knows what I need and he loves me enough to give that to me and he will come to where I am. And uh, I think we can all rest in that. Wow. God knows us. That's a sentence to take with me for sure. I will be taking that and holding that with me throughout the rest of my weeks, hopefully. So even through the unknowns, I can know that God knows me and God knows the world around us. Thank you so much, Sarah, for sharing your story. For those of you watching, take a moment, reflect, pause, ask yourself how God has been there for you amidst some of the hardest times in your life. What are some ways you can lean on him today? Now in this very moment, if you have to close your eyes Take a moment to reflect on Sarah's story and ask yourself those questions. I'll let you all think of that while we watch some testimonies of some amazing women. 
Hi, I'm Lieutenant April Barthel, and in June I was commissioned as an officer of the Salvation Army. My background, I am a nurse, and I have previously worked in the mission field for the Salvation Army, where resilience is key in ministry. I believe it's because of this experience overseas that as I prayed about this testimony, I felt God leading me to share a very special situation in my life. Bonjour, je m'appelle Louise Fernandez, j'ai 55 ans, je suis soldate et employée de l'Armée du Salut à la Citadelle de Montréal. So, Psalm 9, 1 to 4 says, I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of your name. In my second year of training college, I was pregnant with our second child, and we found out that our baby girl was critically ill and would not survive. I prayed for a miracle and refused to terminate the pregnancy. And at 28 weeks, our daughter Peace was born, and she passed away moments later. We named our daughter Peace, knowing that she was now peaceful in heaven with God, and reminding us in verses from Philippians 4, verses 6 to 7, that says, Do not be anxious about anything. Instead, in every situation, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, tell your request to God, and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Toute ma vie, j'ai fait face à de nombreuses épreuves, comme la plupart d'entre nous, j'en suis certaine. Dès mon enfance, je n'étais pas désirée, j'étais un accident. J'ai senti le rejet, j'ai vécu de la violence physique, verbale, j'ai même été agressée. À l'école, j'ai vécu une intimidation incroyable de la part des enfants, mais aussi de la part de certains enseignants. J'étais différente, je me sentais seule, je me sentais mal aimée. Un peu plus tard, dans ma jeune vie d'adulte, j'ai dû accompagner mon frère pendant six ans et demi, presque sept ans, dans une lutte acharnée contre le cancer. Malheureusement, mon frère en est décédé, dans mes bras. J'ai rencontré un homme qui est devenu mon premier mari, avec lequel je suis partie pour vivre dans un autre pays. L'intégration a été très difficile. Mais pire encore quand j'ai compris que je ne pouvais pas revenir, je n'avais pas la liberté de revenir. Malheureusement, la guerre a éclaté dans ce pays, les conséquences ont été atroces. Je suis revenue au Canada, mais pas longtemps après, j'ai perdu mon premier mari parce qu'il en est mort. J'ai rencontré un deuxième homme qui est maintenant mon mari, mais cette rencontre me mettait face à une montagne d'obstacles à cause de l'immigration. Pendant sept ans, on a lutté pour pouvoir rester ensemble. Jour après jour, c'était comme si c'était le dernier jour qu'on allait vivre ensemble parce que les autorités menaçaient toujours de le déporter. À travers ça, j'ai vécu deux grossesses. Deux grossesses qui ont été particulièrement difficiles, dont la dernière où on me disait que cet enfant ne devait pas naître, que je serais mieux de me faire avorter. Je n'ai pas fait bien entendu, j'ai mis au monde cet enfant. Uh, between 2011 to 2015, I had um, lost my dad. Um, a special cousin of mine had been diagnosed with cancer and had also passed away. I was one of the uh, primary caregivers for my mom. And um, life, there was lots of other issues. And life was really, really difficult. However, during that period of time, I never lost any of my faith because I knew God had everything under control. So, in 2015, things finally started to look up. My family and I were on good standings. I had a very good job and things were great. And then in December, first part of December, I started to have severe back pains. I mean, back pains like I can't even explain it to you. They were so bad that I would have to get a bath almost every two hours. And I remember going back and forth to the doctors and to the hospital and they would, um, 
skip me medication and send me home and say, oh no, there's nothing wrong with you. You've got acute back pain. Maybe you just need to exercise, lose weight, all that sort of wonderful stuff. So finally, in January, I remember sitting across from the doctor, my husband and I, and the doctor's sitting there crying and saying to me that I am in the fight for my life and I have been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. So it was determined that due to my diagnosis that uh, they would send me to Dana Farber in order to have additional tests and treatments and well, options for treatments. And uh, I remember on that Sunday before I was due to fly away, I met with um, my prayer warriors in charge in the library. And I remember them praying all around me and then saying, yep, you have something. Pancreatic cancer, it's not bad. I said, okay. So Monday morning, I remember going into work and it was about 10 o'clock and my phone rang. And it was one of the doctors in Bermuda and they said, oh, we've got a bit of news for you. We determined that you don't have pancreatic cancer. You have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. God is at work. I flew to Boston on that uh, Thursday and I had a variety of tests while I was out there. And it was determined that I had a uh, stage four non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I had cancer in my stomach, my chest, my armpits, and my bone marrow. And during my two weeks that I had been out there, um, I had actually gotten sicker and the doctors uh, decided that I actually needed to have chemo right away. So I had chemo out in Boston, uh, two rounds of chemo in Boston and four rounds of intense chemo here in Bermuda. I found that in every circumstance, I can find comfort in his presence, in scripture and by humbly accepting the support from others. I've learned to trust God more each day and I'm so overjoyed that I'm actually pregnant again. It's not always been easy as I continue to remember peace, but I praise God for his faithfulness. And I know that I have become more resilient as I have learned to lean more deeply into my Savior's everlasting arms. Tout au long de la vie, les épreuves sont venues, mais une chose était Ma consolation, c'était le fait de savoir que Dieu était présent pour m'accompagner dans les temps de détresse. Le psaume 46, verset 2, dit que Dieu est notre refuge et notre appui, toujours présent dans les temps de détresse. One thing I have noticed during all my trials and tribulations, that God always has lined things up for me. He has always put things into place to help me through it. And um, I stand before you, yes, a lady in remission. Um, and I know that this is only by God's grace and God's healing power that I stand here before you as a miracle, as God's miracle. All right, Jenna, I don't know about you, but it has been such a wonderful day. <laughs> filled with worship, wisdom. We've heard some stories from amazing women. I just feel so inspired. What about you? I do too. I loved hearing Sarah's and Major Shannon's story. The testimony video was also great. Um, Sarah's point about how God kept her was so touching because the past couple of years have been so challenging for everyone. Um, just with the circumstances surrounding COVID alone, sometimes it feels like all we know is the unknown. So I am truly encouraged by all the stories of resilience we have heard. You know, the thing is, we really don't know what tomorrow holds. We live in a world of unknowns, Jenna, like you said. Mm -hmm. But what we do know is that God is here holding us up and we may not know the future, but the author of life surely does. So that's really encouraging. He restores our past, is with us today and writes our tomorrow. So leaning into him is the best thing that we can be doing. 
Mm -hmm. I completely agree. So now it's time to hear from our guest speaker, oh, yeah. Duffield. She has recently became the director of the Paul E. Magnus Center for Leadership Studies at Briarcrest Seminary, and she's an affiliate with the Leaders Village at Southridge. She is the author of the Brave Way Compendium and the Brave Way, two outworkings of her research and conviction regarding creating environments in which men and women can thrive thrive together in ministry and God-honoring ways. Ellen is also a wife, mother, and grandmother who has experienced both deep valleys and great joy. As such, she speaks from us, from her heart, as well as her research and lifelong work. I'm so looking forward to hearing from you today, so take it away, Ellen. Thank you so much for that introduction, and it's wonderful to be with everyone here today. You can see that I'm sitting in front of my fireplace as well and just enjoying the idea that we're all gathered together across this nation and in other parts of the world as well. But it's as if we're gathered together here in one room. And that's kind of what I'm pretending is I'm sitting here with my cup of tea and enjoying being with you. Us I'm, too. Us too. Oh, good. <laughs> <Same>. <laughs> it's awesome to have you here. <laughs> Ellen, before you uh, get into it, actually, why don't you just give us a little sneak peek of what you're going to be talking to us today about? Yeah, thank you. Sure, I'm happy to. So we are going to be grounding this idea of resilience in scripture. We're going to be looking actually at one of my favorite Psalms, Psalm 34. So I'm really looking forward to that. Awesome. Well, I'm excited. I have my notebook over here, so I will be taking notes as you speak. Uh, Jenna, are you super excited too? <laughs> I am. I'm so looking forward to it. The event has been so great so far. So I'm really, really excited to dig into scripture and hear what you have to say and then and, like ask to apply it to my daily life. Yeah, me too. All right. Amazing. Well, we're ready to hear you speak. Thank you so much. So as I mentioned, we're going to be looking at Psalm 34. So if you happen to have your Bible with you, or if you want to pop it up on your phone or whatever, you might want to follow along. Otherwise, feel free just to listen. I know sometimes I love to just uh, hear scripture read as well. So whatever works best for you. So as you're looking to that, I'll just give you a tiny bit of context. You may know that this psalm we think was written by David during a time of great turmoil in his life, great hardship. In fact, it's during a time when he is hiding out and is pretending to be crazy. Now, I may be imposing my story on top of David's story here, but I'm almost wondering if he maybe was a little bit crazy because of some of the stuff that has been going on in his life. And certainly sometimes over the last few years, I've been feeling like I was going a bit crazy too. So I kind of relate to David in this psalm. But this is one of my favorite psalms because there's so much richness in here. It's a beautiful psalm. And we're going to be looking at a couple of uh, verses in particular, but to give us a context, I'm going to start reading at verse one. So feel free to follow along. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the word there is actually cried out. This is a cry of anguish to the Lord. This is a psalm. This is a prayer during a rough season in his life. And the Lord heard and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. Don't you love that image? And he delivers them. He delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in God. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. For those who fear him will have no lack. The young lions suffer and want hunger. But those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O oh children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What person is there who desires life and loves many days that they may see good? Keep your tongue from evil. Keep your lips from speaking deceit. 
turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. That's a beautiful image as well, isn't it? Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and he delivers them out of all their trouble. And then here are the couple of verses that we're going to camp out on for a few minutes together. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. I'm going to read that again. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. We've been hearing some stories about resilience, and I'm sure there aren't very many of us at this conference who haven't needed to access that resource within ourselves over the last number of months and perhaps even longer for many of us. And so as we ground ourselves in this beautiful passage, I just have a few thoughts for us to think about. If you think back over some of the hard things that you've experienced, perhaps recently or perhaps quite a long time ago, something that was really difficult at the time, but that you have come back from, that you have made it through. That's what we mean when we talk about resilience, isn't it? We need resilience for a lot of things. When the demands of our life and the limitations of the resources seem to, uh, to not kind of balance out, not match up. Or for me, when there just isn't enough coffee or chocolate in the world to kind of help me get through something pretty challenging. Even on our good days, we need resilience to stand up for something, to back down from something, to persist through something that turns out to be way harder than we thought it was going to be, to say yes to something that we are actually kind of afraid to do or no to something that selfishly we would have really liked to have done. Opening up, fessing up, standing up, starting up, finishing up. And let's be honest, some days just getting up all take resilience, don't they? But then there are the really hard days. Dealing with unrealistic expectations, maybe from our core or other places of mission, caring for a child who's ill or particularly challenging, recovering from a failure or lapse of judgment on our part or someone else, dealing with physical illness or mental health challenges as we've heard. All of these things take great resilience, don't they? But what about negotiating polarizing conversations? Anyone had a few of those recently? <laughs> what about debt, perhaps? unexpected uh, work changes that have happened as a result of COVID or any number of other things. Personal discouragement for all of these things, we really are counting on in needing resilience. Not to mention the resilience that's needed if we are going to step into the gap, step into the places that God is calling us that are challenging or move to the margins with people who are experiencing deep challenges of their own. So we begin to see just how important resilience is to the people of God. Webster defines resilience as being able to become strong or healthy or successful after having navigated through something challenging, something really hard. Well, my favorite part of this definition is being able to return to your original shape after being pulled, pressed, or bent out of shape. Anybody feeling bent out of shape these days? I remember the day that I lay down on the back porch of my brother's house many years ago and felt that something inside me actually broke. I can't describe it any other way. Our ministry was experiencing a number of significant challenges and our family was going through, through some really difficult things. And all of a sudden it just felt like it was too much. And it all kind of seemed to bottle up within me 
And then the only way I can describe it is that something within me, something important felt like it broke. And I've walked with a limp ever since then. But the amazing part of that story is, by God's grace, I'm still walking. And that's what resilience really is, isn't it? So when we go back to this Psalm 34, which, as you may know, is written as an acrostic, it's meant to encourage us to learn it and to memorize it. And this passage in particular might be one that we want to memorize. For God says to us through Psalm 34, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us out of them all. There are a couple of nuggets in here that I find really interesting. If you're kind of nerdy like me and you like word studies, you might find this interesting as well. That word brokenhearted actually comes from a couple of word pictures. The word heart refers more to our inner life, and that is actually made up of two Hebrew images as well. The first is the image that represents house, the place of our identity, the place of our nourishment, the place of our safety and security. And the second word actually means staff, like a shepherd's staff or a rod. It's the place of our strength, the place of direction. And so this inner life we're talking about is are the places where our identity is formed, where we are nourished, where we are built up, where we discover who we are and we experience safety and strength and security. But the other part of the word the word broken that we have in here in English is perhaps more accurately described as burst open. It's a very graphic image of being broken or shattered or burst apart. Broken promises, broken purposes, broken relationships, a broken spirit a broken heart. To be brokenhearted is to have the places of our inner security and our inner strength threatened and sometimes shattered. The kind of brokenness that we fear we might never come back from. The kind that only a miracle could actually heal. But fortunately, this passage reminds us that there is a miracle working God at hand. In fact, bookending this vulnerable moment, we see that God is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. That word for near means close enough to touch. The word for crushed is actually also a really interesting word. It's rooted in what I'm going to call blacksmithing terminology. And maybe I just pull that out because it just so happens that my daughter and my husband both love to blacksmith as a hobby. But the idea here is actually something of like a hammer that crushes or flattens something. I, of course, you know, everybody has one of these in their home. I can barely even lift it up. But this is a blacksmithing hammer. And this is the image of this passage, that something is hammered and smashed and crushed. Now, of course, in blacksmithing, you put something into the fire first. And as you put it into the fire, it changes the chemical composition of the metal. And so it not only softens it so that you can work with it, but it actually makes it stronger. And I don't know if you're going to be able to see that, but if you can see at the top of this uh, fire poker, well, this is a piece that my daughter made, we have this beautiful little leaf. The way that that was made was by the metal being hammered. Previously, it was a straight piece. But you see the beauty that can sometimes happen as a result of the hammering. But not only does it make it beautiful and give it shape, it actually makes it stronger. It's changing the crystalline nature of the metal every time that it is hammered, heated, cooled, hammered, heated, hammered, cooled. And as it goes through that process, it actually strengthens the metal and also makes it more beautiful. And so we have this beautiful picture embedded within this verse of God, the blacksmith, God, the one who is near enough to touch us, working intentionally through even what seems like the hardest and most painful parts of our life. 
Perhaps this is why Tozer once said, it is doubtful that God can use a man or a woman until he has hurt them deeply. Because the image here is that God is actually bursting open the things that we would love to hold on to, but that are actually not for our good. Not so that he can destroy us, but so that he can destroy the things that would destroy us. Do you hear me on this? This is really important. It feels like God is destroying us when in fact God is destroying the things that would destroy us. As Elizabeth Kubler-Ross once wrote, the most beautiful people we know are not those who have, are, excuse me, are those who have known defeat, known suffering, known struggle, known loss, and have found a way out of that depth. These persons have an appreciation, a sensitivity, an understanding of life that fills them with compassion and deep loving concern. Beautiful people do not just happen. In the economy of God, when we are blindsided, we know that unexpected beauty is on its way. Now, some people, as we've already mentioned uh, today, are more naturally resilient than others. For a whole host of internal and contextual reasons, we know that some people seem to just ride the waves of adversity a little bit more easily than others. But all of us, we know from research, can learn to be more resilient. And it starts with our worldview. It starts very young. In fact, most of us are wired to uh, kind of respond to the uncertainties of the world and the uh, uncertainties and insecurities of our inner lives in a, one of perhaps a handful of ways. Some people respond with fear, I'm sorry, with anger, fighting back in self-protection against the threats. Some people are like me, uh, are more likely to cower in fear from every eventuality. In fact, my mom used to notice this about me when I was very, very young and trying to help me, trying to encourage me. She would say things like, Ellen, don't worry about that. The things that you worry about rarely happen anyways. Now, if you're like me, you know that that didn't actually help me. That actually increased my angst. So I would lay in bed at night trying to think of every possible thing that could go wrong for me or for the uh, people that I loved. And I would try to worry about them enough that they wouldn't happen. I thought there was some kind of, you know, correlation because my mom had said that. As you can imagine, that didn't lead to the most restful of sleeps. So on a human level, our worldview, which starts very, very young, is very important. But as we've already heard, so are the health of our relationships. Community is incredibly important. In, for, in fact, Stanford professor Kelly McGonigal has found that connecting with others releases oxytocin during times of stress, and that actually builds our resilience. So it's not just something that we imagine helps us. It does actually, at a physiological level, help us. Oh, during times of stress, during times when we're feeling weak, we often pull away from people, don't we? Or at least I know I do as an introvert. And it's at those times that we actually most need to reach out because the message here is if we want to build our resilience, we need to build our relationships. There's a strong correlation between the health of our relationships and our inner health. Of course, our resilience is also linked to things like our personality, our experience of failure and success, which of course is linked to our family of origin and our culture and organizational uh, willingness to accept risk and a variety of different things. Of course, it's also linked to our own inner critic, the strength of our inner critic and a variety of other factors. But as I said, we also know that resilience can be developed. One of the biggest hurdles to our resilience is our arch enemy perfectionism. If we persist in thinking that we must be perfect and we must never fail, we will be debilitated when we have imperfections. And of course, as human beings, we all do. This undermines our ability to take risks and creates a huge burden for us to carry. Maybe it's time for some of us at this conference to lay that burden down. Maybe we need to just give each other a little bit more permission to do that. 
or maybe some of us struggle more with people pleasing. This is the shadow side of our relational strength, isn't it? And it can quickly create like a destructive firestorm that can just be difficult to recover from if we leave it unchecked. Maybe some of us on this call need a bit more permission to practice loving detachment, not allowing ourselves to be enmeshed in other people's stuff or other people's view of us or our own need to be needed. Ouch, that one hurts, doesn't it? Maybe it's time to stop trying to prove ourselves to that person who just never seems to be satisfied anyway. We know that resilience is closely linked to hope. Without hope, fear and disillusionment creep in, crowding out our courage, inspiration, and compassion. The very things that we value and the very things that make us strong. Our world can become very small and self-serving. Hope and resilience are also closely linked to our faith, of course. Cory Aquino, Aquino, 11th president of the Philippines, once said, Faith is not simply a patient that passively suffers until the storm is past. Rather, it is a spirit that bears things with resignation, yes, but above all with blazing, serene hope. Now, please don't hear me saying that if we are struggling, we are lacking faith or that there are not very real dark nights of the soul when God feels very far away. We know that those things are, are real. But the knotted guilt trips that we or well-meaning friends like Job can send us on are not expressions of a truly humble heart, are they? They're expressions of a twisted belief system that diminishes our very real pain to something insignificant when in the economy of God, pain is deeply significant. God gathers our tears in a bottle. He is Emmanuel, close to us, when we feel brokenhearted, when we feel crushed. Sometimes we need to remind ourselves of this, because the pain can actually blind us to who God is and what God may be doing. We sometimes talk about blinding pain, and ironically, that kind of pain can occur just as likely from monotony as it does from tragedy. Certainly life can add unhelpful blinders to our vision if we're not careful. And our circumstances can cause us to look down at the very moment when we need to look up. The narratives that we live by are important. We might be tempted to believe that we are broken beyond repair. Or on the flip side, that we are fine when we really aren't. Or that we need to figure our own way out of our circumstances. Or that God is not truly caring or good. The Spirit reminds us through Psalm 34, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them all. In 1 Corinthians, we see this echoed. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. When we are tempted to look down, when we are tempted to lose hope, when we are tempted to go alone, when we are tempted to give up, God is with us. God promises to provide a way. Now, we may only see the very first step, and it might feel like a hard one. Or even the first step might be unclear to us yet. Don't be tempted to look away. For the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. We can expect there will be afflictions. But the Lord will deliver us from them all. So resilience is closely linked to hope and faith and persistence. It is the breakfast of change makers, isn't it? Do we really think that God would let this season be in vain? Do we really think that Jesus, 
who suffered and died on a cross and rose again and taught that a grain of wheat must fall into the ground and crack open so that the life held in it in microcosm could burst into glorious fullness wouldn't apply that same principle to us. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Now, here's the amazing thing. God breaks away that which would destroy us to make space for that which is life-giving for us. But not only that, and this is the piece that I would love for us to ponder. God takes that space to create a cradle for the healing of the world through his people. One of the hardest parts of suffering is when we can't find the purpose in it. And yet in the economy of God, pain and disappointment and disillusionment and delay and betrayal, all of these things take on great meaning because God comes close to those whose hearts have been burst wide open in order to create cradles of healing for the world so that we can walk beside him, walking with the limp perhaps, walking beside him in redemptive ways, nonetheless. May the Lord be with you. It's been great to be with you today. Thank you. Wow, it has been such a hope-filled day. Uh, I love what Ellen said about her walking with a limp and still walking as a symbol of resilience. It actually makes me think of the story of Joshua having a hip injury after fighting with an angel and Paul with the with a thorn in his flesh, which kept them both humble and reliant on God. We can relate to those things by recognizing our own afflictions and our own pain and being still reliant on the spirit to lead us through those things. It definitely was an amazing time to hear Ellen say that amongst our suffering, we can have joy and we can be resilient in that. It is through our suffering where we find God, where we really are able to connect with him. So I, I just love that so much. And the one thing that she said that I'm going to take with me today is that even though it feels like God is destroying us, he's actually destroying the things that would destroy us. Oh, wow. Just, I love that. I'm going to write that on my wall somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Same. That was so, so good. Um, I am so touched by Ellen and her message. Um, I love how she comments on how God delivers them. Speaking from Psalm 34, God's deliverance is ever present ever present even now and I believe he's going to deliver us from all our hardships and challenges and hopefully soon enough the pandemic everyone is truly resilient um, through the challenges of COVID alone every single person has had to demonstrate this resilience we've talked about today um, I know for myself resilience has looked like graduating high school in a less traditional manner it involved adapting to an online school environment I've had three months of my degree in person so far and I'm almost halfway through my whole degree. So it's been a little bit of a tough time for a lot of students. I know many young people, whether they're university students or children who are resilient daily. I see family, family members demonstrate resilience, essential workers show resilience over and over again, but I also see hope. I love how Ellen emphasized that the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. She touched on how we need to keep peace and pursue it, which comes from God. I know I will be taking these scriptures with me going forward and rely on faith rather than getting consumed by frustration above all, because Emmanuel, God is with us. Everyone is resilient and is resilient. And I just love that. So really, really enjoyed her message. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Some of my favorite parts of today were just being able to tune in, listen, really, even though sometimes you hear the words of resilience thrown around, even though sometimes you feel like you're strong, it's just so encouraging to be amongst a group of women who are just encouraging each other 
sharing their stories, being vulnerable, and all of that combined in this whole premise that we live in the presence of Jesus. Like, I love, love that. And I'm so thankful that we got to join together today to do and talk about some of these things. Jenna, why don't we pray for everyone yeah. that has been with us here today? Okay. Dear God, I want to pray to you today and just give you thanks for the wonderful conference we've been able to take in today, wherever we are gathered across the Canada and Bermuda territory. I pray that every single person who has taken this in will receive some kind of blessing. Lord, everybody has been resilient in some way, and I pray that your faith will continue to fuel the resilience we have to demonstrate as we navigate life's challenges. And I pray that people will know that you are near to the brokenhearted and you will deliver us from our challenges, even when it feels like things are never going to end or the challenges are not going to stop. Lord, I am so, so thankful for Ellen and I'm thankful for our interview and the testimony videos, the wonderful worship. I pray that people are trust and that as we leave today, we can take some of that with us. And just like the woman at the well went back in the town and told everybody about Jesus, I pray that we will do the same in our towns, wherever we find ourselves in Canada and Bermuda. So Lord, I'm truly blessed. I thank you for this event and I am so, so thankful. And I pray that our resilience will shine through along with our faith. Mm. Yes, and I just wanna echo everything Jenna, Jenna said. God, you're a good father. And uh, I just pray for the future for today and tomorrow and the day after that, God, that we would be with you every single day, recognize that you are present with us and that we would just be able to reflect on the fact that you pull us out of the toughest situations and you are there with us in the most joyful of times. So thank you for being a good father in your holy name. Amen. Amen. All right, so I cannot wait for the conference taking place in 2023, but until then, stay safe and remember to trust in all the wonderful things God has in store for you. Everybody, again, demonstrates resilience in some way, so I pray that you'll take that with you today. And now to end us off in a, another beautiful worship set, Laura Hastings. We're creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry. Then from north to south and east to west, we'd hear Christ be magnified. And all
nature finds its inmost melody and every human heart its native cry oh then in one enraptured hymn of praise we'll sing Christ be magnified I'll stand strong and worship you And if it puts me in the fire I'll rejoice cause you're there too And I won't be formed by feelings I'll hold fast to what is true If the cross brings transformation I'll be crucified with you Cause death is just a doorway into resurrecting join you in your suffering then i'll join you when you rise and when you return in glory with all the angels in the saints my heart will still be singing my song will be the same oh christ be magnified let his praise arise christ be magnified You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me, and love has called my name. I've been born again into your family, your blood flows through my veins. I'm no longer.
forgiven because you were forsaken and I'm accepted you were condemned and I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again amazing Amazing love, oh, I know it's true, and it's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. Cause I'm forgiven because you were forsaken and I'm accepted you were condemned and I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again amazing love oh, how can it be that you my king moment let's just take some time to really focus our minds on him on the love of Jesus and put him at the center and the absolute forefront of our minds nothing else matters in this moment everything else can wait we're just talking to Jesus and singing him a love song with our hearts telling him how worthy he is of our praise recognizing that he has saved us from a life apart from love, a life apart from his spirit. And he's with us now as we're singing. He's in the room and he loves the sound of your voice. It's the only instrument on earth that he has handcrafted and he loves the sound of it. You are my king. It's been an incredible day. I pray that as you have shared with us at the well, that it's been a life-giving experience for you. 
We do want to say thank you to those uh, for liking and sharing our Facebook page um, leading up to today's event. We will be in touch about the mug giving giveaway and mugs will be shipped soon. Watch our social media pages for other opportunities in the future to receive a mug. In conclusion, I leave you with this beautiful benediction from 2 Corinthians 13 and 14. The amazing grace of the Master Jesus Christ, the extravagant love of God, the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you.